we're ready to begin. Um, I'm Marlene Lockheed. I am a member of the Princeton Adult School Board, and one of our pleasures of being a member of the board is we get to introduce our wonderful speakers in the lecture series. But before I do that, uh, let me simply remind you, for anybody who was not here last week, to remind you that we will have a lecture on December 18th, and that the talk by Michael Barry will be given at that time, making up for the talk that was not given during the Sandy event. So, um, tonight we have um, a, a talk uh, by uh, Professor Sean Marmon, who in the uh, Department of Religion at Princeton University. Um, Prior to joining uh, Princeton, Professor Marmon taught at Johns Hopkins as a Mellon Fellow and at the University of Rhode Island, also in the Department of History. <clears throat> uh, Professor Marmon has been a Fellow at the Institute for Advanced Study in the Faculty of History, and she writes a great deal about um, Islamic the Islamic world. Some of her published works include Eunuchs and Sacred Boundaries in Islamic Society, Slavery in the Islamic Middle East, and has and a, a one I like a lot, the title of The Quality of Mercy, Intercession in the Mamluk Society. Um, very recently, Professor Marmon convened an international symposium at Princeton on the topic of slavery, race, and gender in Islamic societies. And she is currently working on a book with the provisional title, Slavery, Gender, and Categories of Difference in the Mamluk Period. And uh, she is going to be talking tonight <laughs> about uh, one facet of the general huge topic of women in Islam. And so please join with me in welcoming Professor Sean Marmon, our speaker this evening. Well, thank you, Dr. Lockheed, for that very gracious introduction. And I'd like to thank you all for coming here tonight. Ah, it's not loud enough. Or is it not loud at all? That's part of the problem. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, as they say in the Verizon commercial. Um, is there a clock? Okay, I'll just have to watch mine. Thank you for coming. <laughs> it's a real privilege, and I'm delighted to see you all. Now, women in Islam, or women and Islam, is a vast topic. Uh, there are close to 2 billion, approximately 2 billion Muslims in the world, half of whom are women. Uh, uh, we're having... It's raining. It's, kind of it's raining now. Too much. I need a tech person. And she's a figure that is probably familiar to many of you from the Hebrew Bible. 
know she has an equivalent in the Hebrew Bible, Potiphar's wife. Um, like Potiphar's wife, she's not named in the Quran, but in post-scriptural tradition, she's known as Zuleika. So, there she is, Zuleika, up here. And the other figure I'm talking about is Aisha. But just briefly, you know, as a preface to Zuleika, um, what I'd like to do tonight is lead you through a kind of odyssey, or Zuleika's odyssey, from the Quran through a range of genres within the narrative traditions of pre-modern Muslim societies. And these genres include exegesis, scriptural exegesis, stories of the prophets, love stories, trickster stories, and Sufi allegory. And in the process, I'd like to show that within this very rich body of literature, there are many Zuleikas. You might say there's two extremes. One is very bad. Um, the other is not so bad or maybe even good. But there's a continuum in between of all these Zuleikas who it's very hard to pin them down as absolutely bad or absolutely good. You know, they're more on the bad continuum often, but also they can be good. So they're, they're in this range in between. Now the second female figure is far more important to Islam and to the Muslim community. Um, far more important than Zuleika. And she's a much weightier figure. And that is Aisha, out there, uh, who's the favorite wife of the Prophet Muhammad. Now unlike Zuleika, for Muslims, Aisha was not and is not a figure from a kind of distant prophetic past. Yusuf is one of the many prophets who precede Muhammad. But after all, Muhammad is the last prophet and the most important one. Um, so Aisha is not a literary trope, which Zuleika often becomes. She's a historical figure. And remember that we're talking about the biography of the prophet we're talking about present history, a very present past. Because his biography is so important, it's so crucial for Islamic law, for Islamic piety, for Islamic identity. Now, we also have a tremendous body of information about Aisha. Although academics would probably disagree with many pious Muslims about kind of the nature of this information, we see it not so much as an exact representation of the truth, but constructions and reconstructions of historical memory. Now, there is more than one Aisha, because in the Sunni tradition, and I'm sure that you know, ever, most people here, certainly in the news, you've heard about Sunnis and Shis, and probably most, if not all of you, know that these are two, two important kind of conflicting traditions within Islam. Uh, so in the Sunni tradition, she's a source of religious authority in a number of ways that I'll be talking about later in the lecture. But the Shi Aisha, believe me, is a very different Aisha. And Aisha becomes a site for sectarian conflict um, or the development of sectarian identity. Now, if nothing else, you will come away from my discussion of Aisha with one important fact. Any woman or girl you meet named Aisha is not a Shi. Now, let's start with Zuleika. And I have this wonderful image up there, um, great medieval Persian miniature painter, Bizod. And uh, I'll briefly give you kind of the story, this image is an illustration, the Quranic story from the chapter of Joseph or the chapter of Yusuf, which in the Quran is called the best of stories to a certain extent parallels the, the biblical narrative. Joseph, Yusuf is the favorite son of the prophet Yaakov, Jacob. His jealous brothers throw him down a well, and they tell their father that little Yusuf was eaten by a wolf. Yusuf is pulled out of the well by some merchants, and he's sold into slavery in Egypt. He has a good master who tells his wife, treat this boy kindly, perhaps we will take him as a son. But when Yusuf reaches adolescence, his master's wife is overcome with sexual passion for him. 
And when they are alone, she shuts the doors firmly, as the Quran tells us, and literally says, come hither. Yusuf says, God forbid. But the Quran tells us that she desired him and he desired her. That God or some divine force, and later exegetes discussed what this could have been, stops Yusuf from acting on that desire. But no divine force stops the woman who is later named Zuleika. And in the Quran, they are described as quite literally racing to the door. Um, she's, of course, trying to catch him. She grabs his shirt from behind and tears it. And then when they get to the door right there, coming home, is her husband. Um, she says, he tried to rape me. Her husband says, ah, oh, the shirt is torn from the back. Obviously, you're lying, and he's innocent. And then we have this very important verse in the Quran. Uh, it's verse 28 of Surah 12. When the husband says, this is from your guile, and oh, your guile is great. Now, he's... In this verse, the husband is using the feminine plural. So he's not saying, you, my potentially unfaithful wife, uh, you, your guile is great. He's saying women as a category. Oh, this is of your women's guile. Women's guile is great. And this becomes a kind of catchphrase. There's a whole genre of uh, pre-modern literature called the guiles of women. Um, it's almost like a proverb, and it's used, as you can imagine, often in a semi-humorous way and in, in a very directly disparaging way. Now, to continue, and, and of course this is not an illustration from the Quran. The Quran is never illustrated. It's an illustration from uh, a Persian poem, which I'll come back to, to later. It's a love, poem, a love story, but it's also a Sufi allegory. <clears throat> so the master asks Yusuf to overlook this. He tells his wife to repent. And of course she doesn't. Now, the second element of the story, which you will not find in the Hebrew Bible, but I think it's, it's a great element of the story. It's very vivid. Uh, the women in the town start ridiculing um, this, we'll call her Zuleika now, Zuleika, and saying, ah, she's chasing her, her young slave. So she invites them all to her house, and she gives them knives. She sets up couches for them, and she gives them knives. Now, the later exegetes usually say, you know, she gives him fruit, and the knives are to cut the fruit. And she calls Yusuf, who's standing outside the door, and says, come here. And he walks by, and all the women cut their hands, because they're so overcome with his beauty. And they say, obviously, they don't ridicule her anymore. They say, this is no mortal. This is a noble angel. And they do not say it in a pious way, though, because they all lust after him, too, and they become complicit in her deceits. Now, it, Yusuf, uh, finding himself in this difficult position with not one but many women lusting after him, um, he says to God, I would rather be in prison than be the victim of their guile. The word guile keeps coming up. So he finds himself in prison. And then, you know, there's a story in between, like I said, that many of you probably know from the Hebrew Bible or elsewhere. It's not really important for my narrative because I'm talking about women. And the women drop out when he goes to prison. And they only come back in when the king of Egypt wants to bring him out of prison. And he sends a messenger to Joseph or Yusuf. And Yusuf said, you know, go back and tell him, ask him about the women who cut their hands. So the king calls them. And the king knows, apparently, automatically, inherently. He accuses them of lusting after Yusuf and, and lying about him. These are the women who cut their hands. And they say, he is innocent. He didn't do anything. And then the woman who started it all, Suleika, speaks up and says, normally in the Quran, now that the truth is out, I can tell you that I tried to seduce him and he's innocent. And then the women drop out again, and the rest of the story goes on, and like most stories in scripture, whichever monotheistic tradition, it's a story about men. Now, we're not told, <laughs> we're not told that the women are punished or that Zuleika is punished. You know, the story ultimately is a story of forgiveness, but it's a forgiveness of brothers. So we don't know. Maybe she was forgiven, maybe they were forgiven, but they just disappear. Now, what's of interest 
just for the purposes of my lecture, is what happens to Zuleika, I mean the other, her friends who cut their hands, kind of were less important, um, in the centuries following the compilation of the Quran, uh, in start with scriptural exegesis, which already appears in a very highly developed form um, in the famous exegesis uh, by the scholar Tabari. Exegesis, and then he wrote his next work was a multi volume universal history, History of Prophets and Kings. Now, Yusuf and Zuleika appear in both works, obviously in his Exegesis of the Surah of Yusuf, and then in his History of Prophets and Kings, where there's two volumes devoted to prophets, he's in one of those volumes. Now, the Quran is very condensed, it's very elliptical. And even the story of Yusuf, which is one of the few kind of straight narrative lines we have in the Quran, it's, there seems to be parts of the story that we'd like to know that appear to be left out. And this is what Tabari and other exegetes and historians of the prophets tried to do. And Tabari, like a good historian, he summoned up a range of, of authorities, of sources, admits that there are all these different versions and details within the story. He tries to judge which is more likely than another. And then he also admits that even among the responsible, respected authorities, there may be some, some slightly different versions. Now, the, I think the first reason why he pays so much attention to Zuleika is because this event of, you know, kind of the chasing of Joseph or the chasing of Yusuf raises some very important questions about Yusuf as a prophet, uh, about prophets in general, and certainly about women, but I think at this point women are still secondary. Because it's the question of mutual desire that is troubling. Why does she desire him and he desire her? Why should a prophet feel it was the desire to begin with? Um, what actually stops him? Is it God? Is it a vision of his father? But it, it, it's a source of, of anxiety. So in order to kind of explain, kind of come to terms with this story, he develops a more expanded Zuleika. She becomes more of a character. He gives her life in a sense. She's beautiful. She's wealthy. Uh, rather than just saying, come hither, uh, she Tabri gives us a dialogue. She said to him, oh, Yusuf, how beautiful your hair is. He said, it will be the first thing to fall out. <laughs> she said, oh, Yusuf, how beautiful is your face? He said, it belongs to the dust, which will consume it. <laughs> so is, that should have put her off, you would think, but it obviously didn't. Um, so there's an emphasis on her beauty, her sexuality, her tempting words, points to some dangerous qualities in women inability to control their transgressive sexual desires, and that these desires can imperil the social and moral order. Now, Tubbery's history kind of leads into this genre of stories of the prophet, prophets, some of them, like Tubbery's, are very learned, they're very highbrow, but some of them are very lowbrow <coughs> indeed. Um, the authors don't bother with citing sources, they want to give good stories, and usually they bring in an element of humor, um, and they really create a more developed Zuleika. Very, she has some very negative qualities. She has use of stepmother because indeed his master adopted him and gave him to her to raise. There's a kind of incestuous element there. Um, there's a duplicitous old woman who's often a stock figure in stories of kind of the wiles of women. So like his wet nurse who gives her all kinds of tips to encourage her. Um, and then she threatens to commit suicide. 
unless you've appealed to her desires, which puts him, of course, in a difficult position, but he doesn't yield. But then as the story develops, we see the beginning of a love story. So Leica loses her possessions. She becomes Yusuf's slave. When she asks him for mercy, he frees her and marries her. Um, or another version is her husband divorces her. She weeps for 17 years or perhaps 40 years. She goes blind. She's old, abandoned, and ugly. Uh, Yusuf meets up with her, and he forgives her and marries her. Um, and God, you know, as a sign of his mercy, makes her beautiful again, restores her beauty, and uh, restores her virginity. Or, <laughs> in a different version of the story, we find out she never lost it because Tubbery, as a kind of, you know, a mitigating circumstance, says that he's heard from some authorities that Zuleika's husband did not approach women. So, you know, she was perhaps sexually frustrated. So, this is the rehabilitated Zuleika. The, the last person I'd like to refer to, and here we have another miniature of her chasing Yusuf, and that's a little blurry, but that's a, a very frequent representation of her fainting from love, as we get more into the, the love story. And the two miniatures I have here, uh, there, as you can see, is the beautiful Yusuf, who has a halo, like all prophets, and the women are cutting their, their hands. And this is, looks like the same one, but it's a different one. And here we also have the fainting uh, Zuleika. That's the happy ending. That's their marriage. Um, in this magnificent Sufi epic by Jami, <coughs> it's a long, elaborate narrative which gives us all these elements of Zuleika's life. It gives you this incredibly complicated story where she really is a heroine. And she falls in love with Yusuf when she's seven years old, when she has a deal with him. And she becomes, you know, on one level you can read it just as a, a great story, as a love story. But she also becomes, she is a symbol within the, the, the Sufi allegorical side of the poem of the soul longing for God, longing for the beauty of God. And the Sufi is always represented as a lover who longs for God. It's an unrequited love. The Sufi longs to annihilate himself or his soul, her soul, sometimes, in God himself. Of course, that's impossible, or for some great Sufi ministers, it have, it, if it occurs, it's for a very short duration. So she becomes the lover, the mystic seeking God. <coughs> but as I said, you can also just read it as a good story. And in the conclusion, we have, once again, Bad things happen to her, happy ending. And there's one nice reversal in Jami, though, because in almost all of the narratives, and at least in his narrative up to the point of the marriage, it's Yusuf as an object of desire. Zuleika is the one who is longing, who is desiring, who in the earlier narratives is lusting, and she's lusting and loving. Um, but once they enter the, the marriage chamber, uh, Yusuf desires her. Jami actually gives us a lot of details about loving looks, about kisses, love bites. Um, and then when they finally consummate the marriage, she finds that she's a virgin. And in this case, in this story, it's not because God made her a virgin again. It is, in fact, as she tells him, because her husband was impotent. And having dreamed of Yusuf when she was seven years old, she had kept her jewel, as she puts it, safe for Yusuf all this time. Very happy ending, and they have children, which they, lots of children, which they usually do in the, the conclusions. Now, just very quickly summing up Zuleika, uh, you know, I've tried to give you these examples, different genres, different narratives, where she is either, is almost a central figure, or she's an important figure, usually in connection to Yusuf, where she can either be an example of the guile of women, um, where she could become this kind of ambivalent character who would kind of sympathize with, sympathize with her bad behavior because her husband's impotent and because she does Yusuf, love Yusuf so much. And she can also become a Sufi allegory. However, just before I move 
on to Aisha. I think we should not forget that in the actual Quranic narrative, the whole story of deceit and evil deeds is set into motion by Yusuf's brothers when they first throw him down the well and lie to their father. And this was not lost on the medieval exegetes or religious scholars. One of the great scholars of the Middle Ages, Ibn al-Jawzi, was a 12th century scholar. In one of his works, he presents this kind of dialogue between men and women. Men accuse women, and they say, you were the Ones who, you are the ones who plotted against Yusuf, and they use plot in the sense of you know, sex and deceit. And the women respond and say, and you are the ones who threw him down the well. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, moving, <laughs> moving on to Aisha. And I don't have many representations of her. Uh, there is actually a manuscript, a Turkish manuscript, Siyad and Nebi, that's has a lot of, you know, it's fully illustrated, and much of it, a great portion of it is about Aisha's life. Um, but I have not yet, yet to get access to, or make the effort to get access to um, reproductions, except for a couple that I have here. Now, as I said, she was the favorite wife. Uh, when the Prophet died in 632, she was 18 years old. Um, she was the daughter of the Prophet's closest companion, and also was the first caliph. Now her favored status in the Sunni narrative makes her a very important authority. As I mentioned earlier, she really is an authority for Islamic law and practice. Because the life of the Prophet, the practice of the Prophet, the Sunnah, is the really the authoritative source for Islamic law. Now in the way this is articulated in of the Islamic legal tradition, they always say that their source is the Quran. But I think in reality, because the Quran does not have much in the way of legislation, the first source is the Sunnah. Now, we get to the Sunnah, we find out the Sunnah through Hadith. In this kind of legal and religious context, it's a story about the prophet, something that he did, something that he said. And it's a story that has to have a sound chain of transmission. Starting with the person who was with the prophet, who saw or heard something, and then that person has to relate it to someone else, who relates it to someone else going through generations. And every person in that chain has to be sound, but the most important person is the first one. And Aisha, because of her favorite status, that she spends so much time with the Prophet, she's literally with him at all times. She's the only wife who's with him when he prays. She's the only wife who's with him when he receives revelation. She becomes this Hadith authority. Now, she also has a very special role in relationship to the Quran, which will come out, I think, in, in my discussion of two stories or two incidents that are kind of the most important, I think, incidents in her life, and they occur when she's very young. Um, the first one when she's 15, and the, the second one probably when she's around 19. Now, the first one is called The Story of the Lie. And probably some people, does anybody even know that story? Oh, good, so I won't be telling you something you already know. Uh, the story of the lie is that the prophet and his warriors are coming back from a raid, and Aisha went everywhere with him, and she's on an enclosed litter on top of a camel. They stop for a rest. She needs to relieve herself. She goes into the desert, but she realizes that she's dropped her pretty necklace. Kind of typical of a young girl, she wants her necklace back, so she goes back to look for it. But she's very petite. So while she's out looking for the necklace, the men who are in charge of her litter, they lift it on the camel and they don't realize she's not in it. <laughs> so she comes back and no one's there. She wraps herself in her coat and cloak and lies down and kind of hopes for the best. And then a young lawyer comes along. Um, 
and he's very respectful, and she will not even speak to him because of her sense of chastity and honor. But he puts her, and I'm not sure how he puts her on the camel, because they're not supposed to have any physical contact, but in some way she ends up on the camel, and he leads the camel back to Medina. Now immediately people begin to gossip, and Aisha falls very ill, she doesn't, isn't really aware of the gossip, she goes back to her parents' house, so her mother can take care of her, and then she starts to hear the rumors, and she, of course, first person she talks to is her mother, and her mother, like any doting mother, says, don't worry, dear. Jealous women always gossip about pretty wives. But after a point, she has to worry, because it accelerates. It becomes a great communal issue, kind of tearing apart the community. And she has already noticed that the prophet who adores her has not even come to visit her while she's sick. And finally, one of her female relatives says, you are accused of adultery. And she turns to her parents and says, why don't you defend me to the prophet? And they say, we don't know what to say. Um, which obviously means that their confidence in her has been shaken. So Aisha becomes a kind of, of Yusuf. She's falsely accused of adultery. And like Yusuf, she always tells the truth. And in fact, one of the titles of Yusuf is Yusuf or Joseph, the teller of truth. And the title she receives in, in Sunni tradition is Aisha, the teller of truth. And uh, she's a, a very assertive young girl. And she finally finds her own voice. And she says, you know, by God, I will not repent because I haven't done anything wrong. I will not confess to a lie. And then she says to the prophet, I'm not going to defend myself because you wouldn't believe me. Um, and then she devotes the, the, the Quranic surah of Yusuf, but in a very kind of cute way, um, because she is young and probably not very learned. I tried to remember the name of Jacob, Yaqub, but I couldn't remember it, so I said, I will say what the father of Joseph said, my course, or I will show beautiful patience. And that indeed is a quote, because when Joseph's, Yusuf's bad brothers bring his bloody shirt, so that his shirt image, to his father, Yaakov, his father doesn't really believe them, but he says, I will show beautiful patience. Now, meanwhile, what's happening kind of among the important men and I put down the name of Ali, and I said important person, because in fact there's almost too much to say about him. The son-in-law of the prophet, he married the prophet's uh, favorite daughter, Fatima, um, the father of the prophet's only male descendants, um, great warrior, early convert to Islam, converted as a child. He's really an icon in both Sunni and Shi'i Islam. Um, so the Prophet calls two men to him, Ali is one, the other is, is another kind of righteous man, and asks them, and the first one says, the other righteous man says, absolutely, she's innocent, it's a lie. And Ali says, you can replace one woman with another, get another one. <laughs> um, now, fortunately, the Prophet does not take his advice, and uh, he decides to resort to God. He wraps himself in his mantle and lies down and waits for revelation. And God sends down a revelation declaring her innocence. Now, what's crucial, however, for the subsequent she narrative is that she's not named in the revelation. It's a declaration of innocence for a woman who's falsely accused. Once again, if we kind of think of Aisha as a teenager, and you know, much of this is told in her voice, she says, when he got up, I thought my parents were going to die. <laughs> because, of course, they were so anxious. Um, as I said, she's vindicated. Now, her hostility, the bad blood between her and Ali, continues. And the, the second important incident of her life is, you know, after the prophet dies, there really is no designated successor, and there's a great deal of contention about who should be the leader of the Muslim community. Um, Ali thinks he should, or at least he's presented, is thinking that he should have been the immediate leader after the prophet, and that's certainly the, the Shi tradition. Um, but he has to wait a while because there are uh, three other caliphs before him. 
And when he finally becomes caliph, he's immediately contested. Various challengers. Well, the first challenger is Aisha, who raises an army. I mean, she's 19. She raises an army, uh, kind of recruits two of her male relatives to act as her generals, and she leads her army against Ali. And it's called the Battle of the Camel because, once again, she's in this enclosed litter on top of a camel, and her troops all rally around the camel. And even when the tide is turning against them, of course, to protect her and defend her, you know, they're around the camel and you know, dying around the camel. She loses. Ali sends her to a, do a kind of house arrest. Um, it does not do him a lot of good because he's subsequently assassinated, and one of his other challengers becomes Caliph by default. Now, going back to the story of the lie, the story of slander, I now want to give you the she narrative. Because it's very relevant to what happens in the Battle of the Camel and to this beginning of this very profound Sunni-Shi divide or, um, over who should have been charged with the community. And of course, that develops later into a whole Shi theology about the Imams, and Ali being the first. Now, in order to kind of further frame Aisha's really evil behavior, as the Shi see it, of leading an army against Ali, uh, there's a necessity to completely reframe her life. And there's certainly, it's a very different historical memory. So there's the story of the lie and the revelation. So the new Shi version is that actually the prophet had a Coptic concubine who coincidentally had the same name as Mary, Mariam, mother of Isa, who's one of the very important figures of the Quran. And the story, the Shi say is she is the one who was falsely accused. She is the innocent woman about whom the revelation is sent down. And the person who started the rumors was Aisha. Now, the she version even goes beyond that because it says she accused this innocent woman that she herself did commit adultery with that young warrior when she was off in the desert looking for her necklace and came back. So in the she version, she is not Yusuf. She's Zuleika, but she's much worse than Zuleika. She lies about someone who's innocent, and she herself actually commits adultery. You know, Zuleika doesn't have the chance. And also, Aisha's acts in the, in the Shi version much more profound con uh, consequences in terms of the Muslim religious community, political legitimacy, religious authority. So, kind of to, you know, to sum this up, um, I've given you in the first part of the lecture several Zuleikas, um, said from the bad to the kind of bad, kind of not so bad, to you know, the Sufi allegory really positive because she represents the, the search for God. Now, you know, I want to emphasize again that Aisha is not Zuleika. She's a much more important character. Zuleika becomes almost a kind of literary trope. Aisha is definitely, I think she is a historical figure, and she's definitely um, perceived as one. Now, Aisha in the Sunni narrative is chaste, the favorite wife of the prophet, the source of religious authority. In the Shi narrative, she's literally called a fahisha, the whore. And her transgressing her presumed or transgressing of sexual boundaries is also a transgressing of political boundaries, religious boundaries, social boundaries. It's not just a transgressing, it's turning things upside down. Now I guess you know the first kind of obvious point I'm making is that there are very different possible representations of these two important female figures. But I I kind of like to go beyond that. You know, in our image of Islam today, and certainly Islam is very much in our faces, as it were, in the media and you know, real international events and, and concerns for uh, national and personal security. Um, 
And let me just add that I think as important as those concerns may be, they're manifested often in a kind of generalized Islamophobia. Um, but in the midst of this whole confluence of concerns and events, we tend to think of Islam as something very dry, very puritanical, very rigid. And if we hold on to that image, we really miss this rich, multifaceted tradition that is literary and religious, that spins into all these different genres. Um, and central to all these genres are these stories. They're engaging stories, they're moral stories sometimes, sometimes they're funny stories, sometimes they have an important political message to tell us, sometimes they're just beautiful stories. Um, and they can show us the figures who are good or bad, and then in different representations of that figure, in different Zuleikas, for example, and in these radically different Aishas, um, they can sometimes, and of course Aisha is really bad for Shis, and she's very good for Sunnis, but there are some problems with her raising an army. Um, it, it, there's a possibility of all kinds of complexities and continuums between the good and the bad. So these figures are within kind of this rich context of stories, and I hope that one of the things I've shown is that the stories are not all about men. <laughs> so, uh, let's take questions. Let's have questions now. I hope you have some questions. Although, actually, let me give you just quickly. This is good. Aisha is a Sunni Aisha. She's with the Prophet. Her, her face is veiled, um, and often the Prophet's face is veiled when he's he's shown in representations. And she is, you should see her hands are open. She's asking the prophet to show mercy to this captive Bedouin girl, which he does. And this is the prophet's deathbed scene. And this is also one of her sources of legitimacy in the Sunni tradition. The prophet died in her room. He died in her arms. And he is the last person, she was the last person to whom he communicated some of his wishes about who might be the leader of the community. But there she is, she's the only female figure. She, she's veiled, and it's often these showing of halos, there's little Hassan, well they're not so little, Hassan and Hussein, um, Ali and Abu Bakr, the the halos often indicate that somebody is either a prophet or related to a prophet in some way. So, those are all my pictures, and now I, I'd like some questions, or I hope you have some questions. Yes. I saw somebody has their hand up over there, a gentleman. Well, I don't think, you know, it's a, it's a pretty patriarchal text, but I'd say the same thing of the Hebrew Bible and the, the New Testament. I mean, they're all patriarchal, but in terms of positive female figures, definitely. I mean, the Queen of Sheba is not only positive, she is a figure of a woman in authority. Um, and she goes, after meeting with Solomon and converting to monotheism, she goes back to run her kingdom. Um, the wife of Pharaoh, and in the Quran story, it's not Pharaoh's daughter, but Pharaoh's wife, who finds little Moses and raises him and protects him. Um, she's a very positive character. She practices woman's guile, but in a positive way, again and again, to kind of trick Pharaoh and protect little Moses. And in fact, she's considered to be one of the first martyrs, because she literally physically attacks Pharaoh um, when you know, the crucial point comes when he's sending his, his troops to you know, pursue Moses, and she's killed. So yes, there are some very positive figures. The only one who's given a name is Maria, um, who's actually in some ways not quite as exciting as some of the others, but she obviously is key because she's the mother of the, the prophet Esau or Jesus. But they're all given names in subsequent exegesis and stories. Yes, so the gentleman in the red shirt, 
Sounds like there are two Qurans, is that right? And if there are, why? No, there's not two Qurans. You so talked about the Sunni and the Shia. No, they have the same Quran. Absolutely. But they interpret it differently. Because like the story of Aisha said, the revelation that comes from God doesn't name her. It doesn't say Aisha is innocent. It refers to a woman. Now the Sunni tradition is that that was Aisha who was exonerated. But the Shia tradition is no, because Aisha is very bad in their tradition. It was Maryam, the Coptic woman, who was exonerated. I think it's a very typical, I mean, it's in, in scriptural exegesis in Judaism and Christianity as well, that there are different exegetical interpretations. But they're written that way. They're written differently. No. The Quran is written one way. The subsequent, like, uh, interpretations, you know, that come later after the Quran, uh, they have very different points of view. No, the Quran is considered to be the word of God. It, it can't be changed. Yes? From those interpretations, do you see a different role of women from the Sunnis versus the Shia? Is it you know, translatable to the present age? Well, that's an interesting, it's, a, it's an interesting question. It's, it's one that's often asked. You know, does Aisha, as this active woman who go, you know, leads an army, does that translate into a, a more positive role? And, you know, it's a little problematic because even the Sunni religious authorities had real trouble with her leading the army. Um, and, of course, everyone rereads their stories. And certainly I have seen kind of feminist readings, feminist Muslim readings that, you know, praise Aisha and say, look, all these women who lived in the time of the Prophet, they weren't at home in the private sphere, they were out in the public sphere. Now, I don't think, the fact that Aisha can't figure in for she women I don't frankly think that really makes a whole lot of difference because when I look at the pictures of the young women who were on the streets during the Green Revolution, the young women who were in Tucker Square, I'm not sure they needed a paradigm. They didn't need to think, ah, Aisha, or in the Shia case, Fatima. Because, you know, people, often religious paradigms are there to legitimize what we do if we're religious people, um, but they're not necessarily causes of what we do. So, so, I mean, I think the biggest change has come that in the, the starting in the 19th century with the advent of modernity in the Muslim world as in other parts of the world, there was a huge change in the understanding of women's roles. Yes, the lady in the black parka. Um, I, I have two questions that are unrelated. Sure. Uh, the first question, I have a Muslim friend, and she's told me that Islam has actually improved the status of in Arab countries, and that it was because of Islam that, that women were allowed to own property and inherit property. Um, and I just wondered if you wanted to address that. Then my second question was about Zuleika and wondering about um, the, the concept of the guile of women and if that's what led to the covering. No, it didn't lead to the covering. Okay. Um, you know, covering is a is a tradition that preceded Islam. Um, it's often associated with high status. Uh, the justification for covering that comes with the jurists is actually a very ambiguous uh, passage in the Quran. The Quran wants his wives to be kept separate. Or Muhammad, at least God, speaking to Muhammad, wives are supposed to be kept separate. Uh, people are supposed to show more etiquette. Just They can't just walk into the Prophet's house. Um, and God says that women should cover their bosoms, probably, is what they should not show their charms. And really, probably what is meant is not so much covering the head. But regardless, the way the jurists interpreted it was that women should cover their heads, not their faces. That is a kind of, that's going an extra step that is not required. Um, now, in terms of Islam improving the status of women, uh, that's a common statement that's made. Um, you know, it's a very modern statement, and I don't have a problem with it from a, a kind of religious women or women within a tradition rereading uh, the religious tradition. We all do it in every tradition, and we should. Otherwise, we would be stuck back in those old patriarchal days forever. Um, as a historian, I think it's, it's, we're not really sure because we don't really know what was happening in 
uh, Arabia before Muhammad. But it is certainly true that Islam gave uh, property rights to women that they did not have in, in Europe until relatively modern. He was illiterate, um, and I don't think I don't think I really heard it about Khadija. But the story is that you know, first of all, there was an oral preservation of his revelations, and then that people did indeed various followers they wrote things down on you know, parchment or little pieces of camel bone, but that a lot of it was orally preserved, and that the third caliph was mine because he was concerned that this was going to be lost, brought all these people together and actually. You know, compiled what is now the standard text of the Quran. <coughs> but I don't know that I think. Uh, Khadija is very important. She was his first wife. He didn't take any other wives while she was still alive. Um, he had many, many wives uh, once he went to Medina. Um, one of the things that Aisha says that was one of her claims to be special is that she was the only virgin wife. Because all of his other wives were either widows or had been married before. Yes. start seeing it only in the 19th century. Uh, and, but as a historian, I can't say necessarily that it's true because we don't know. Our knowledge of pre-Islamic Arabia comes from later Islamic sources. So, and you know, there are some coins that may be pre-Islamic. It's very hard to know what really was going on. Like I said before, we can say that women had, um, in, in terms of you know, commercial law and property, they had more rights than European women. Does that mean they had more rights than they had before Muhammad's revelation? I, I can't say. Yes. Oh, wait, over. What is somebody that I'm missing over? Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. That's okay. Uh, given what you've said, is there some way that you can... Um, Tell us how the kinds of practices that we hear so much about today, where women are truly repressed in some areas, and how a group like the Taliban <coughs> developed their own particular set of practices that really repress women. Well, Michael Berry, who's coming to lecture, I think he's the, the next lecturer. Oh. Yeah, he knows much more about the Taliban than I do. Well, it's um, not so much the Taliban as the the, the status of women and... As, once again, speaking, you know, with Zuleika, I was showing you, trying to yeah. show you a, what is a religious narrative and also this wonderful, complicated literary narrative. You know, Aisha, this figure who's so uh, central to the biography of the Prophet, the early community, and this kind of good Aisha, bad Aisha. But when, actually speaking as a historian about women's status, I... You know, I don't, you know, when I look at the pre-modern period, I certainly don't judge it by modern standards, but at the same time, it doesn't mean that I unequivocally think that everything that men did was, you know, okay. In modern periods, a whole different thing. There's so many women activists, and Iran is, it, it only gets attention in the press today because of the nuclear um, issue, but Iran probably has and has had for many years the most active and the most courageous women's movement. So the Islamic revival, kind of the, the new version of a very conservative Islam, yes, it really does resurrect and, and impose a lot of very conservative um, rules for women, in polygamy, uh, unilateral divorce, um, 
men being, and it's in the Quran, that men are set over women. Um, but I don't think that that's how most Muslims live their lives on that two billion. Um, I think that people have all kinds of accommodations with their traditions. Um, and they are selective about them. And even these young women who are part of these revivalists, and I don't necessarily mean you know militant groups, but revivalist groups, like you see in Egypt, there really is a religious revival. It's why all these young women are women are wearing hijab. In the 80s, it was practically impossible to find a woman on the streets wearing hijab. But these same young women, who you know, I read an article about the group of young women going to a class with the sheikh, who's saying, asking them these questions like, "Don't you agree?" that a woman's place is in the home. I said, yes. Don't you agree that the husband should be in charge? But I can guarantee you those same young women are out working. Almost every woman in Egypt works. People can't afford not to work. Egyptian women, Iranian women, uh, they're half, or in the case of Iran, over half of university students uh, in some of the most prestigious faculties, like engineering and medicine. And they tend to uh, score higher on the baccalaureate than, than boys do, girls who score higher. So when you have those kinds of circumstances, it's often hard to, even in Iran, which has such a repressive government, it's really hard to impose uh, certain strictures on women. And I would say, you know, Iran tries the hardest with its very brutal police on the street, secret police, whatever. But once women are out working, it's, it's kind of hard to push them back. Is that a long, a very long answer to your question? <laughs> so, Taliban asked Michael Berry. Is that one more question, and then we should wrap this up. Thank mm -hmm. you.